Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. would like to take this opportunity to welcome one of my very good friends and someone from whom I have learned a great deal during these last few years. Would you all welcome Hal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hal. Grateful alcoholic. And as some of you may know, I try to practice an attitude of gratitude because I have a lot to be grateful for. I pray every morning that wonderful little prayer from the 24-hour book. I pray that I may be grateful for the things I have received and do not deserve. I pray that this gratitude will make me truly humble. And tonight I have another good example of why I'm grateful, the wonderful dividends this program has given me. Because to be honest with you, back in my boozing days, I normally wouldn't have associated with a man who'd walked on the moon. I just didn't travel in those circles, but by the grace of God in AA, I've been a friend of Buzz's for a number of years, and we uh, helped him celebrate, and I can continue. The East Coast celebrated him his fifth anniversary, it's five years of continuous sobriety in AA, so we will continue that tonight, and it's a pleasure to introduce a man who needs no introduction. Buzz, come up. My name is Buzz, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm nervous, too. Uh, I don't do this all that often. Uh, and and I just hope that uh, somehow we can get a, a nice informal rapport going. And uh, that's kind of up to me to do. I quit smoking two days ago, three days ago. <clears throat> but I also need to tell you that I quit smoking four years ago. <laughs> uh, this hasn't been the easiest uh, endeavor in my life. I came first came to... Uh, into treatment about eight and a half years ago, and I have had a variety of different recovery assistors and uh, institutions, people, friends, wives, and uh, one thing is crystal clear. I'm a far better man today than than I was eight and a half years ago. And if there's anything that you carry away from our bearing witness to victory over our difficulties, it's that this program works. I grew up in New Jersey, a rather upper-class family, uh, my father is Swedish, and uh, my mother was sort of half Scotch and uh, half Welch. <clears throat> and believe it or not, my uh, grandfather's name on my mother's side was Faye Arnold Moon. Uh, it was a well-to-do family. My father had been an early aviation pioneer. He learned to fly in 1917, and he uh, 
was General Billy Mitchell's aide in the Philippines, where he met my mother, who was a daughter of an army chaplain over there. And my father went on uh, in his uh, Air Corps assignments to command the, uh, or to be in charge of the engineering school at uh, uh, Wright Field. And he was a commandant there for about four, five, six years. <clears throat> and since he uh, had a doctor's degree from MIT, he observed and instructed most of the leaders that eventually became the uh, major generals or the, the leading generals during World War II. Uh, I was, uh, he uh, uh, went into the reserve in 1928 and went to work for Standard Oil Company. And shortly before uh, I was born, they moved into a house and he stole, sold a lot of stock in 1929 and bought a house so that when the crash came in the market way, we came out of that uh, situation pretty good. I had two older sisters, one of them about a year and a half older and the other uh, three years older than that. And uh, until I made a legal change in my name this last week, my name was Edwin Eugene Aldrin, Jr. And everybody wonders where in the world Buzz came from. Well, the Air Corps people called my father Eddie for the first name Edwin, and my mother called him Gene for Eugene. So when I came along, there wasn't any really uh, appropriate name, so they didn't want to call me Junior. So to my sisters, why, that creature crawling around the floor was Baby Brother, and she couldn't pronounce that, and it was Baby Buzzer, and uh, <laughs> that changed throughout the years. And it used to make me embarrassed to think about that story. And let's see, I was 24 years old and uh, at the Air Force Academy when I finally got grounded for flying low over the beach in New Jersey and finally was able to live up to that name. My family was involved in social situations that required them to, or at least I was exposed to the fact that uh, uh, highball was an item of social lubrication, or at least that, that seemed to be something that kept things going. And uh, my father was a very hard-driving person, and there's little doubt that uh, that influence on my life of wanting me to follow somewhat in his footsteps tended to mold my early life. I uh, was put into kindergarten at the earliest age possible, four and a half, something like that, and uh, and even though I was really immature for first grade, they lobbied with the principal and, and kept me there. And that was great because when I got out of high school at uh, just a little over 17, I was near the top of my class academically. But I didn't really fit in. I was very good in athletics. I was on the football team, on the first team, and uh, a pole vaulter. Uh, I sure wouldn't want that to happen to, to my children. And the reason that I'm giving you that background is because that plus a, an ethnic background of uh, Scandinavian Plus, a lot of environmental situations, I think, brought on the alcoholism that uh, saw its maturity a bit later in life than perhaps uh, many of you might have seen. My, my mother uh, was a very depressive person. I can remember when, when we were children uh, that they would have their drink at the dining room table. My grandmother was living us at the time, and it was just constant constant bickering and uh, it just wasn't really what I would call a, a happy home environment. And my two older sisters were, got married and they, they left and I went to West Point. And uh, I, I just don't think my mother enjoyed things. They, they moved from a house into an apartment. And she would associate with some of the uh, shore 
New Jersey Shore ladies who would get together and they'd have their drinking sessions. And that was her circle. And she didn't go socially where my father went. He'd go into New York and uh, be in the Wings Club or uh, he got into Rotary. And that was the kind of environment uh, that I grew up in, but I grew up as, as an achiever. An achiever who knew by the measure of my standing relative to those around me that that somehow I had what it took in the particular test, however narrow it really was, but I really didn't deserve it because I didn't feel like I deserved it. <clears throat> and it, when I got to West Point young, I just didn't feel comfortable there. There were the older people and the people that socially got together and uh, there were some people who had had a couple of years in the army before. You know, uh, the first Christmas that you're at West Point, uh, at least it was that way then, you don't get to go home at Christmas. And of course, I lived in New Jersey and it was just a short ways up the river. Part of the, during part of that Christmas uh Vacation. The, the plebes are there, and a few upperclassmen are staying there with them. And I can remember getting a, a Coca-Cola and putting some aspirin in it. Because, you know, things were just not that comfortable. And I don't think there was one smidgen of an effect that it ever had on me. But that's the frame of mind of, uh, of what I... I, I mean, obviously, I, I wasn't about to have someone bring in a bottle of whiskey. I wasn't that mature. And yet on graduation, of course, we're mature enough to command uh, uh, flights uh, in combat. And we're mature enough to command uh, platoons. But, you know, a lot of times I look back in, on, on those days in my youth and I just shiver to think how ill-prepared I really was. And a lot of it was in my mind. Frankly, uh, uh, a good bit of my life on up until glimpses of peace and comfort in the last, i got to say about four or five years, maybe two years. That's pretty good last week, as a matter of fact. <laughs> it, it, it really is getting better. <clears throat> two months ago, I was in the pit, so... Uh, I really don't think there were, uh, well, I, when I was in high school, uh, being on the high school football team and the track team, there were fraternities and sororities, and, and for the initiation, you know, people would uh, do a big thing of pouring all sorts of jazz, mustard, and uh, ketchup, and this kind of sauce and that kind of onion stuff and a little bit of beer and a little bit of one kind of liqueur and another and uh, those were big things uh, as a freshman and New Year's Eve with French 75s man that was really really bold you know I, I, I just don't think we grew up in the same era or the same times and I know that that isn't true for people of my own age that, that grew up I may be flavoring things a little bit uh, as I view the past as it being kind of an, an immature recollection. I uh, graduated third in my class at West Point, and of course, with the background of my father being in the uh, in the Air Corps, uh, I wanted all my life to get into. Uh, airplanes to fly. I had my first flight. I vaguely remember this by people telling me and then my visualizing thing. I, I really think I can remember a flight when I was about a year and a half or two years old. We flew down to Florida. And I got sick. <clears throat> and about a, a year or two later, I uh, got a chance to, as a veteran now, uh, uh, to take off in a, an amphibian in Newark Bay when my sister had her first flight. And she got sick. And, you know, I felt pretty good about that. And incidentally, that plane was 
was uh, there's a picture in our basement where that plane was uh, christened by Amelia Earhart. And uh, General Mitchell, Billy Mitchell, came through our place in New Jersey on his way to New York in the uh, early 30s, associated with his uh, court-martial appearances. And uh, Jimmy Doolittle has been a friend of my folks for a good long while. So you see, I, I, I grew up with a certain amount of achievement, a certain amount of uh, associating with the, uh, with the achievers, with the winners, and that sort of thing was expected of me. Or I certainly expected of myself, and uh, on, on the records, it certainly looked as if uh, I was doing that. After going through uh, pilot training, I uh, went over to, uh, my first assignment was over to Korea. And obviously something had slowly been happening because uh, somewhere between Camp Stoneman in California and, uh, and Tokyo, where I visited some friends on my way to Korea, I had made a resolution that I wasn't going to drink. Now, not every second lieutenant makes that resolution. Obviously, that's not average reaction to, uh, to, the, to the kind of childhood I'm talking about. There was something that was going on there, and it was an insecurity. It was a feeling ill at ease, not deserving the sort of things that were coming my way, and obviously an awareness that alcohol, though it was making what I did a bit more comfortable at the time because that's what the other people did and they seemed to enjoy it and it did make things a little bit easier for me to do. But clearly at uh, the mature age of 22 going over to fight in the Korean War, not drinking alcohol was important enough for me to make the resolution. And I got over there and I uh, saw some of my friends the reason I didn't go over with, with actually with the same time as some of our uh, flying classes because I'd taken a, a slight delay competing for a Rhodes Scholarship. And uh, don't you think the fighter pilots at the uh, gunnery school at Nellis uh, had a time kidding me about, uh, you know, the, the commies were going to have me in their gun sight. I got a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> well, that's okay. I... I didn't get that anyway, and I can rationalize my way around that. Uh, there were occasions, uh, well, let me just carry it through. A short, it didn't take two or three days for me to realize that there was no way that I was going to handle this situation with my friends over there and, and my not drinking while well, everybody was in the club drinking. So... That resolution went by the board. Now, let me uh, backtrack a little bit. And when I was competing for a congressional appointment uh, to either West Point or Annapolis, this is my junior year in uh, high school, I went to a prep school uh, to try and teach us how to pass that, that exam that, that people over there in the hill would give us. And it, it was... It was uh, what you'd call a, a real general, well-rounded education, especially in vocabulary. we get the dictionary out, and we went from A's, and we learned the words down through the M's by the time the course was over. Uh, so if we had vocabulary questions on the latter part, why, that was just the breaks. Uh, while I was there, there were, uh, it was a group of about uh, 10 or 15 of us, and naturally for a little excitement, we decided to, to skip out one night. And there were going to be four of us, and we got this janitor to get us a bottle of whiskey. The only trouble is he brought back gin. And instead of four of us getting out, there were only two of us, me and this other guy. And he, had, he was obviously a bit more savvy and aware, and I recognized this, but I was damned if he was going to drink any of my share of that. And I was a stumbling, blubbering, incoherent, puking, 16-year-old uh, 
example of American youth that night. And uh, that stuck in my mind for quite a while. But it didn't stop me from drinking because, as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, several years later, I made the resolution not to drink at all. There were several occasions when I was uh, in Korea when one in particular that I that I remember, it was on a training mission before we were qualified for combat, and something uh, went a little wrong with the emergency fuel control, and I had to hold a switch in a, in a spring-loaded position in order for uh, the engine to operate normally. Uh, what the fuel control had failed in a way that it was full on 100%, and the only way that you could uh, get anything other than full power in this uh, F-86 was to throw this switch. Uh, and it, of course, that was the same hand that you had to push the mic button on. So the whole operation was really uh, not what you'd call smooth. I I was trying trying to maintain formation with a guy, and I kept climbing high, and and I lost him. And I, it was just a bad scene, and I didn't feel good about it, and I was obviously a little hungover. And when I got on the ground, I wasn't going to drink anymore. And uh, that lasted three or four days. And there's always a reason why, you know, that's not important anymore. I don't want you to get the impression I was, I was a cream of American youth about this time. Uh... My military, well, I got, I got married shortly after I uh, came back from Korea at age 24. Uh, uh, slightly on, on the rebound, uh, from a s turn down. Uh, and that, that marriage eventually lasted 19, 20 years. And, uh, we were assigned to the, uh, Air Force Academy. I was aide to the dean of faculty. Again, you know, up on the pedestal. That was when I got um, caught for buzzing the beach when a guy was walking his dog along the coast of New Jersey at 5.30 in the morning. You know, nobody's supposed to do that. My God. That wasn't so bad, but the next day, uh, Sunday morning, as I was leaving, why I went up and down the beach, out over the shore, or o over the ocean this time, put the gear down, of course, so I could demonstrate to everybody that the airplane would fly slow and uh, that same doctor had a pair of binoculars out, evidently. Uh, I had a, an efficiency report that was endorsed for the, the short period that I was there as a, uh, they used the term self-effacing. And, uh, you yeah, know, that made me feel bad. Here I thought I was a forceful, aggressive person. Maybe a little on the shy side. I certainly wasn't... Uh, the, the tiger, the life of the party of, of the captain who was the other general's aide. But that was a, a very accurate appraisal of my, my state at that time. Uh, I was very competent young officer. I was a good pilot, outstanding pilot in some ways. But I was self-effacing. That means I didn't project the best of me forward. Uh, there was always greater potential if you'd, if you'd only do it right, you know. And I think uh, uh, there are a good number of us who uh, have experience living under maybe conditions similar to that. There, there's another breed of cat, and that's the very exuberant one, and, and he's the, the insecure one who's maybe using the, the outward exuberance and joke telling to maybe cover up some of the insecurity. We're all insecure and we, we just manifest it in different ways. Uh, I'm not sure that it's particularly pertinent to all the, the lucky breaks that came my way after being a fighter pilot in uh, Germany. This, this particular wing we were in was uh, F-100s, and because uh, I got to, to pick uh, my assignment when I left the Air Force Academy in, uh, let's see, 1956, 
<clears throat> I pretty much had to pick the cream of assignments, and this was the hottest airplane that we had in the Air Force at that time, and it was in Germany, and it looked like a really good assignment. Uh, we were in day fighters, and uh, we, about halfway through that tour, converted over to uh, tactical weapons delivery, nuclear weapons. And that's a humbling experience, uh, transitioning from where you, you hassle uh, the guy in the air to when you're on a five or ten minute or fifteen minute alert. And, and if, you know, you, if that happens to be the day, why, you're on your way. And, and it's a lonely feeling to be stooging at low altitude, 360 knots, uh, each tick on the, on the map you have marked off. And, uh, it's, it's not very sophisticated in those days. It was, uh, so many minutes you're supposed to go so far. But it was a very imposing mission. And yet one of the first times I was on alert, I had one tremendous hangover. Now, most everyone else did the same sort of thing. Uh, it didn't show quite so much, perhaps. When I uh, left that assignment, I... Uh, went back to MIT and uh, had decided that fast reactions and, uh, and fighter pilot business was great. And, you know, I, I felt I could do that and was on the uh, squadron gunnery team representing our squadron in, in NATO. Uh, but somehow I just didn't want to be destined to that for the rest of my career. So I wanted to, I guess, take the same route that my father had. Uh, so I went back to school to uh, MIT. Uh, because of drinking wine out of dirty wine glasses in Naples on the last vacation that we had over uh, in Germany, uh, I was in the hospital for hepatitis for about uh, nine months. It was really quite a case. Right at the beginning of my uh, MIT, I was to see I was a captain just uh, promoted to uh, major. No, I, yeah, and no, I was promoted to major uh, a year or two after I was there. <clears throat> uh, when you have that severe a case of hepatitis, you're not supposed to drink, and people say, uh, gee, maybe you had not a drink for the rest of your life. Not me. After, you know, five or six months, I'd, I'd have a drink, and that appeared to be the right thing. I was uh, at MIT uh, a year and a half, and I decided to uh, extend for another year, year and a half to work on a doctor's degree rather than go through. Uh, I was really following very closely the uh, the path of uh, Ed White. He and I were uh, at West Point together. He was a class behind me, and we were in the same fighter unit over in Germany. And... Uh, after he he came back uh, about a year or so or earlier than I did, and uh, but I, we corresponded and he had applied for the uh, he said he was going to apply for the second group of astronauts and he'd gone through the test pilot school. Uh, I had elected to put that off sometime into the future and uh, to uh, stay at MIT and work on a doctor's degree, and I went through a process of reasoning that uh, as as I look back on it. Uh, it, it, it sounds very mature reasoning for somebody at, at, at that point, but I picked a, a course of study in uh, manned orbital rendezvous. I wanted to use the experience that I had as a fighter pilot and the uh, sophistication of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and air inertial guidance and orbits and trajectories and, and do something that would be useful to the service or to uh, NASA within 15 years. Uh, when I applied for uh, that second selection group of uh, astronauts, uh, I wasn't qualified because I hadn't been through the test pilot school. But I, but I had a rather envious record at that point uh, that I'd accumulated uh, at, at West Point. Uh, combat in Korea, I'd shot down two MiGs over there, and here I was working on a doctor's degree at MIT in rather good physical shape, but I wasn't qualified. So Ed was picked in the second group along with uh, nine, eight other people. And that was in 1962. And uh, they changed the rules in 1963, and you didn't need to be a graduate of the test pilot school. 
they put a little bit more emphasis on, on education. So uh, I was picked to uh, get into our astronaut program in uh, 1963. And I didn't feel like I belonged there either. Because I, I wasn't one of the boys. I wasn't one of the test pilots. I had other credentials, of course, that in many ways uh, supplemented what I, what I had lacked in experience. Those were rather productive years in, as I look back on what I was able to do in terms of having a small influence from what I studied at MIT, having an influence on the directions and sort of the, the methods in, in which we uh, carried out our program. <clears throat> By this time, I had uh, three children uh, quite close together, uh, two years about separated the, the first two and Ten months separated the, the second two. Um, they were, oh, let's see. Well, right now they're 28, 26, and 25. So uh, that was like... Uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago. The, uh, influence of the space program on me was rather awesome. Uh, there, there are a lot of details that could explain why I happened to end up where I did, but a lot of it really was being in the right place at the right time. Uh, it was it was a productive period. I felt I contributed significantly. We played relatively hard. Uh, I don't look back on those years and, and say that there was much of a progression of alcoholism from the active participating standpoint, from the emotional build up to a crisis or crescendo that was going on, and I didn't know that it was going on. <clears throat> I, uh, I had my first flight uh, in 1966 in November, and the impact of public appearances and, in a sense, the loss of direction being in within my grasp and my influence, at first, that was the first I really began to see someone else telling me to go do something that I didn't feel comfortable doing. And I know I had to do it in one fashion or another, and, and I did it. But looking back on it, I can remember some periods of rather immobilizing concern, anxiety, and fear. Obviously, of not looking good, of not doing what I thought I ought to be able to, and not living up to their expectations. <clears throat> After Apollo, this came in spades. Really. The carrying out of the mission itself was unencumbered. It was just uh, a, a beautiful experience to be a part of. But there was always that uneasiness about what this was going to mean to my life afterward. And, uh, and I began to, to feel the effects of this immediately on, on return in terms of the concern for looking good. Uh, I was under medication for antidepressants when we were on our round the world trip. And I drank considerably for comfort along with that. Uh, I stayed uh, in Houston with NASA for about a year, year and a half after that, working on uh, the very preliminary parts of the space shuttle program 
and kind of wandering around to the degree that I didn't have public appearances anymore, kind of wandering around with, with the freedom to direct and misdirect and waste uh, some of my time while I was waiting for an assignment back to the Air Force. Uh, I was given an assignment uh, to command the test pilot school at Edwards. Uh, I didn't think that that was too good an assignment uh, for somebody that had never been through school, first time anyone's commanded it who's never been through it. And at a time, I mean, they, they get, you know, a, a, a space hero in to govern the uh, test pilot school at a time that they were de-emphasizing space at the test pilot school. I thought that what I could do while I was there was go through the school with the students and still administer. And But Jesus, I'd been away from the service for 11 and a half years. Three and a half at MIT and seven and a half at, uh, uh, in the NASA program. Not a lot of leadership or management in either of those situations. And uh, I wanted to compare myself with what I ought to be able to do under those conditions and what my other classmates who had been going to command and staff school and Air War College and all that. I was a setup for a crash, and I kind of crashed and was admitted to a psychiatric uh, hospital with a cover-up of, of having a, a neck problem, which I had. My fingers were getting a little numb. While I was there, I made decisions to make big changes in my life. Uh, I was through competing in the Air Force, and uh, this marriage that I had wasn't all that satisfactory. And uh, here I was with the red badge of courage, having seeked help, and man, I was confident I was going to get it all together. So why not write a book about this glorious story where I'm going to marry this divorcee from New York? And uh, that really sounded good at that time. Of course, most of the time I was in this hospital at uh, in San Antonio, on the weekends, every weekend I was off somewhere visiting, hunting with somebody or visiting somebody else and drinking considerably. I remember one time coming back into the hospital uh, carrying a bottle of scotch in my uh, navigator's kit bag. Now, when you're in a hospital trying to get yourself put together uh, and, and, you know, people are paying a lot of attention to you and you're sitting in the office with uh, uh, a guy who's got uh, a picture of Freud on the wall with uh, stars on his uh, shoulder. <laughs> anyway, uh, you just don't uh, sneak in scotch into the hospital room while you're doing that. That's not quite normal behavior. Uh, eventually, I wrote a book about my experiences called Return to Earth, which had to do with seeking psychiatric help for my fear and anxiety, emotional problems. I remember a number of years after that, meeting a guy by the name of Abbott Mills somewhere, and he said, I read your book when it came out, and I said to someone, God, I wish somebody would tell this guy that he's just purely an alcoholic. <laughs> this was in 1973 that I wrote the book. <clears throat> and... Um, big deal. I mean, the, the emotionally wounded guy, what, what happens? The National Mental Health Association nominates him as National Chairman of the Year. <laughs> and, and guess what he gets to do? He gets to go around the country making public appearances. <laughs> well, it was about me this time. And, you know, for a while, that was an interesting to, story to, to talk about my recovery from uh, depression except I didn't quite make all of the appearances. I'd gone through a, a separation at the time and had the freedom to be in my own place. And so there were times when I just wanted to stay home and drink. The, uh, the last flight... Let me see. While I, while I was uh, going through this business, I went through uh, S-training. and uh, Well, even before that, uh, the shrink I was seeing put me in the VA and... Uh, in 1974, for eight days. And uh, he was the shrink who had retired as a colonel in the Air Force. He was also the same guy that was at uh, Brooks Air Force Base when they ran our 
qualification physicals for the NASA astronaut program. He didn't know too much about alcoholism in those days, obviously. <clears throat> but he's learned a lot, and he's now uh, certifying pilots for uh, uh, recovery from alcoholism for the FAA. And I'm sure he's learned a lot, and we've all learned a lot. Uh, uh, but we didn't all get the kind of help that we needed back in those days. So in 74, I, uh, in February, I guess this was actually 75, yeah. I was hospitalized for eight, eight days in uh, February, and I went to my first AA meeting, and I saw master sergeants there, and I saw other people who were sloshing around the hospital in bathrobes. Uh, it didn't make any difference that I happened to be sloshing around the bathrobe, too, but I was different. Anyway, I had no interest in that program at all. In April, I went through S training, and uh, I drank considerably the night before, and uh, peed in my pants considerably the first day of S training. Uh, drank in between the two sessions, and you're not supposed to do that. And yet I thought I received a good bit out of the training. Now, this is uh, April, May, sometime around July of 1975, I got an invitation to fly down to the Cape in uh, John Denver's airplane with Werner Earhart to see the Apollo Soyuz flight. The only trouble is I had to tell him two days before that I couldn't make it because I was in the middle of a binge in my apartment. And it was a couple of weeks later that uh, I went into my first recovery uh, with my fiance by the name of Beverly taking me to a place in Orange County that was called Beverly Manor. It later became uh, known as Care Manor about a year later. I got to say that my recollections of how I was functioning then are just sort of hazy. I, I didn't feel comfortable, and at the same time, I, I fit into that recovery program and played volleyball with the rest of them. And uh, thought, in a way, uh, there was a sense of relief. In, in going into that first program of recovery, because I knew there was something wrong with me. Clearly, I'd been hospitalized for depression, anxiety, and uh, having gone through several uh, releases or surrenders, I guess, made my first entrance into AA a bit uh, easier. Actually, it was a relief to think that yeah, all I got to do is don't drink what's in that bottle, and you know it's a much nicer, cleaner thing to do to have wrong with you than this nebulous, cloudy thing of of uh, emotional depression, which is. And if I look back on it now, all that was going on was that alcoholic fear, fear of losing what I had or not getting what I want, and and those things are common regardless of what what the particular sets of circumstances happen to be. <clears throat> My first uh, five months uh, uh, in the program was really not in the program very well, and it was because of being a special person. Uh, I don't think there was a soul who would have succeeded in convincing me that 90 meetings in 90 days was the thing to do. Uh, it was very uneasy, and uh, within about six or seven months, I was back in the hospital for depression and given some medication prescribed by a physician who was in one of the recovery places, and it was a, an improper uh, prescription for me at that time. Then I had a series of uh, 20, 30-day periods of sobriety. And all during this time, I'd been introduced to the uh, Navy program and visited there off and on just to see what it was like down in Long Beach. And I had met uh, Dr. Persh down there. <clears throat> About five, four or five months later, I was in recovery down there. And, uh, and for five weeks, I went through the Navy program. And there were guys who really didn't think I was going to make it. Uh, a roommate called me up uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, said, we, we just didn't think you were going to make it. And he called me from someplace uh, in Florida, and he wasn't making it. 
<laughs> My first sponsor really was not tough enough on me, or I wasn't listening. I had another sponsor, and I sort of picked him out because he had had a lot of experience in depression. And I was going through a good bit of it, and after five months, I had a, another six-pack or a, a pint or whatever it was. And this is now two years of recovery, and, and I'm just not seeing any progress. So some of the people that I knew uh, uh, thought that maybe I ought to go see Clancy. <clears throat> so I uh, turned myself into the Pacific Group, and I had a year of sobriety that was fearful. I can't say it was humiliating. It was it was a it was a reduction of ego during that time, and it was a learning process of of commitment. Uh, and it was all a very good period for me. I think Clancy would probably agree that we sort of wore each other out during that period. And I think he could see it coming that as my uh, first year approached, I took my cake, and before I'd taken two cakes, I was drunk again. And there was a relationship going on during the time. And that had a lot to do with it. I was trying to rescue and save somebody and be detached, and you can't, you just can't do that. Um, that, that was eight days of uh, continuous drinking with a friend of mine, and we went up into, uh, into the desert, and then he sort of went off and had to go to work and do his stuff, and, and it was miserable. And I came back, and I was rescued by the guy that was chasing this uh, girlfriend around, and I, I really pecked at my wrist that night. A feeble effort. I, I obviously didn't want to accomplish very much. And I called her up on the phone, and she wasn't there, so I went over and I broke in, and the neighbors uh, called the cops, and uh, they came and hauled me off for breaking and entering. I was a little over three and a half years into this program. Not too much progress. <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks later, I had to appear in court to pay a pay for the damaged door, and she didn't appear, but this guy did, who had been 13 stepping and all that. And that was degrading, and the anticipation of that got me drunk again. <laughs> After that first eight-day period, I was in the hospital, miserable eight days trying to dry out and recover, and I didn't want to do that again, and I didn't do it that time, and, uh, and I uh, cold turkey, and that was October 25th, five years ago. I guess some of us have to go through what we need to go through. I uh, was exposed to varieties of recovery people, recovery modes, hospitalizations. Uh, I, after five or six months of searching around, I found the sponsor that I have today, and, and we meld together rather nicely. He's, he's an engineer. He works for Hughes Helicopter, and, and we have compatible views of spirituality. I found out early in my recovery that I had to, I felt it necessary for me to strip away the hypocrisy that I had grown up with. Even though things were very meaningful and it was important for me to, uh, as, as, as a quiet astronaut participation, participator to march in the parade for Martin Luther King, and it was meaningful for me to take communion on the moon. Uh, but somehow, being an elder in the Presbyterian Church, even with uh, with right stuff, John didn't feel quite right to me. Uh, so I had to strip away that and, and rebuild. And uh, I don't think I really have the time to go into my outlook on spirituality now. But it's a much more comfortable one. I. I can say that in the last five years, uh, things have gradually gone up and down, and what has been characteristic of my recovery is that all the ups and downs are, uh, they, they, they may last a little longer, but they're not as deep, they're not as threatening, and in a sense, I bounce off and, and I participate in life in an exuberant, comfortable way. Uh, and 
I have the peace and happiness and the self-worth. I have a very unstructured life. And I wouldn't really wish that on anybody. You ought to get into a commitment where you need to be there. It makes things much easier. But the freedom of being able to choose what I want to get into has had glimpses of working in the last couple of years, and it is really beginning to work now. And, and I feel that, that what I'm involved in reflects what uh, Joe Persh told me in one of our debriefing sessions about uh, oh, a couple of years ago. He said, your contemporaries went out and, and they did their thing, and, and they're kind of living on whatever they did do and what they're doing now. You have the potential, because of what you've been through and what you've worked your way through and what you have experienced in change and growth, to be a much more useful person, a much more comfortable person. <coughs> there are a lot of tales that I'd like to have told you that I've heard from the podium before about uh, cucumbers changing into pickles and uh, they never go back again or... Uh, well, things things that I've heard uh, my sponsor talk about that are very meaningful to me, uh, and he heard them from somebody else. If you are going to meetings and things just aren't working, and you after a while you stop going to meetings and you wander down and you sit in the bar for a while, and uh, you're not sure what you're going to do, but the bartender comes up to you and says, "Hey, what's the matter? Uh, uh, I, I thought you'd gone to AA. What are you doing in here?" Doesn't AA work? He says, you've got to be honest with the bartender and hopefully honest with yourself because if you didn't work the steps and you didn't go to meetings, you've got to say to him, you don't really know whether AA works because you never tried. And I've tried in the past five years to work this program, and I can't say that I've got all A's for it, but, but I'm earning the benefits of it now, and uh, there's no doubt, and I, and I just know you got to believe me, because I do, that of all the great opportunities that have come along to me by talents, by birth, by upbringing, by being in the right place at the right time, uh, none is going to produce more meaningful results in a human being than this program. It's gradual growth and, and, and what I am learning from sharing with people. And that's where it all is. Uh, I, I don't speak very often before groups, but I, I feel that maybe if I was a little bit more in my preliminary life leading up to this, it was to maybe show you, give you a glimpse of the person that I that would have been standing here eight years ago. And the person that, that I know people have seen that remember me what I was like five years ago, three years ago. And it's getting better and better. And I know it. And I tell you, there's nothing like knowing that, that you're getting weller. And I wish that the blessings that I've received from the program, and they're not all great. I mean, I spend some periods where I don't want to participate in life, uh, and I eventually get back out of it. And I lose a few things, but I regain those opportunities again. And I, and I just hope that you can get as much out of this program as I have, and it's all really here, and it's, and it's in this book, and my sponsor gave me this cover, and uh, it, it means a lot to me, and I wanted to mention some things that are significant in there about the second edition, the story about the paradoxes. That touches on the essence of what I'm beginning to see as a spirituality that exists between reasoning human beings just as much as if I drop this, it's going to splash on the floor, and those are physical laws. The laws that govern the relationships between us are embodied in the spirituality of this program and and those are as much a law and that's a power that's mighty greater than me and uh, refinements of that are, are the essence of of what makes me know that, that this program works and it keeps me coming back and I hope you keep coming back to every one of you thank you
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.